I've always loved adventure, but nothing really could have prepared me for what I was about to face to face with the Walk Around the World for Unity. This is the story of the entire walk. When I genuinely nearly gave up, I nearly laid my life down and had to rely on faith more than I ever have in my entire life. It wasn't my intention to always walk at night time, but there were moments when I found myself in places I didn't want to be. In the world around us, it's very broken to help build trust, to identify the beauty and the love present in every single person around us. Mercy is the most wonderful, courageous action we can choose in those moments. We all know the story of Jesus saying, I tell you, forgive your brother 77 times. What I hadn't recognised is that sometimes we forgive someone for the exact same incident. We have to forgive them 77 times for the one thing they did. In today's episode, we're going to look at the struggles of forgiving others. In San Jose, the capital city of Costa Rica, there is one six lane bridge stretching across a huge canyon between the main city of San Jose and the satellite city of Alahuelia. And on one particular day, I happened to cross it and then had a youth group of nine youth asked to join me for that 18 kilometre walk that day, which is one of the shortest walks that I had on the entire journey. Now that particular youth group was led by two adults, Damien and Tatiana, a husband and wife. As we walked down towards that six lane bridge, on the other side of the road, of the freeway, was a slum. And two young men appeared on the edge of the slum, whistled across the road to us. Okay, we're heading down the highway right now. We're gonna show you where the mugging took place. We've been driven here by Tatiana. I've been staying with Tatiana and Damien for the last week. So we're heading down the highway at the moment. Uh, we'll show you, I'll show you what happened when we get there. The basic story goes though, there were 10 or 12 of us? Uh, 10 of us. There were 10 of us. And as we crossed under a pedestrian bridge on the other side of the freeway, there was four men. They whistled out to us and then proceeded to follow us down the edge of the highway. And we made it down to a large bridge, at which point they crossed over and mugged us. So I'll just show you those areas when we get to them. Tatiana and I locked eyes. We knew exactly what was about to unfold. They ran down the other side of the six lane bridge. By this stage, we were already on the bridge. Okay, this is a pedestrian bridge just up here. So we came in just on the left. And as we came into the pedestrian bridge, there were some guys standing just off here where these fellas are. They're just in here actually, just standing there. And they whistled out to us and proceeded to follow us down the freeway here. They were walking up here, up the top, there's a little road up there. Some fellas up there. Anyway, we were heading down on the left-hand side, down along the gutter there. Tatiana and I quickly communicated with each other. We'll just compact the group together. We stay together. With our compact group, we've moved as quickly as we could. Those young men though, those four men ran as fast as they could or crossed this massive bridge, ran through the traffic, jumped the center barricade, through more traffic, and then made their way back down the side of the highway to us. The four of them stretched out along the group, reached into the back 
of their pants and pulled out massive long blade knives. They pinned me with a knife against my abdomen and pinned Damien, who was a similar size to me. They pinned us at, we happened to be at either end of the group. The other two went along everyone else, stripping them clean of everything that they had, taking sunglasses off their heads, taking mobile phones out of their pockets, taking watches off them, taking backpacks from them. At the end of the bridge here, just where this car is going past, the one up there about now, they ran over, and right there is where we got mugged. Right up against the, the barrier. And they took everything from us that they, they possibly could. So they lost most of the gear that we were carrying. Uh, everyone lost their mobile phones, those who were carrying them, uh, their watches, sunglasses. Uh, I lost my backpack, a fair bit of equipment, about $2,000 worth. I had to spend a bit of money trying to make things up, but lost a fair bit of gear. He eventually, though, reached up and unclipped my backpack. He took it off me, he knelt down on the ground, and then couldn't put it on. He actually struggled to put my backpack on. I remember standing over him, staring at him, actually praying, God, what do you want me to do? Like, do you want me to actually help this guy? Do you want me to help him to rob me? He can't even do it properly himself. Now eventually he got the backpack on. The other guys had already started running. He's the only one there. There was one moment as they ran off when I looked at this guy kneeling on the ground in front of me and thought, you're gone. Your mates have left you. And it actually crossed my mind to lean forward, grab the back of his head, and ram my knee into his face, knock him out, grab my backpack back and get everyone else off that bridge. I actually took half a step towards him to do just that. And I stopped. I had felt only three days earlier that God had asked me to not retaliate. In these situations, don't fight back. And I stood there and just watched him struggle to put my backpack on, get up and run off. Once everything had calmed down, media arrived. There were police everywhere. It was a circus. Police came from everywhere. We, we ended up... We ended up having uh, two motorbike police ride past us just after we'd been mugged. And then uh, Damien and I started to give chase and we're trying to bring the police attention to the, the four guys running away. And then there's another motorbike on the other side of the road. Then all of a sudden there were police cars everywhere. Um, presume someone driving past had made a phone call because the police just swarmed around us. And then one of the, one of the policemen drew his gun. It was quite an, ad an adrenaline rush. One young girl though, a teenager, couldn't stop crying. She was desperately upset. And Tatiana was trying to calm her down. Eventually, Tatiana said to her, what's wrong? We're okay. No one got hurt. What is wrong? And the young girl, through tears, said, the guy that kept coming back to me, kept pulling his trousers down slightly to show me the gun he had concealed in his trousers. And he said, if either of those two guys, Damien and myself, if either of them move, if they attack one of my mates, you're the first to die. And they both happened to be looking at me as I took half a step forward to the mate. The other two were already running. He was at the other end. I hadn't seen that he hadn't run yet. He was waiting for his mate. And when I took that half a step towards him, he put his hand straight onto his gun. And she thought she was about to die. Now, thankfully I took a step back. He took his hand off the gun. He got the backpack and they ran. I was so angry at them. Not that they'd mugged me, but of threatening that young woman. I was so angry with them. The funny thing is, the day after the mugging, I got to meet one of the guys. The police found one of them. His name's Danny. 
Damien and I went to the police station. We met him in his cell. We chatted with him. He apologised. He said, we didn't mean to scare you. We just needed the money. We were hungry. I forgave him. Damien forgave him. In fact, Damien gave him his rosary beads. Here's the problem. About three days later, I found myself dwelling on that incident again, and I had effectively taken that forgiveness back from God. I realised what I'd done, I forgave them again. I kept going back into that moment. I kept finding myself taking that forgiveness back. What I hadn't recognised is that sometimes we forgive someone for the exact same incident. We have to forgive them 77 times for the one thing they did. When I got back from the walk around the world, I didn't like people. It's just the reality of everything that happened. It was such a difficult journey. I came back with post-traumatic stress disorder. In fact, I spent my first two weeks on this very dam, kayaking by myself, surrounded by black swans. I didn't like talking to people. In fact, when I got back from the journey, I didn't sleep through a single night for six months. I'd wake up every night from violent nightmares, just one after the other. The record was 10 times in one night. I woke up and woke up from such violent nightmares, I wake, woke up in a lather of sweat. The next day I'm supposed to go to work and be normal. I think everyone has found themselves in a position where they keep reliving the same hurt. We forgive someone, or perhaps we don't. Perhaps we just move on and we hope that God won't forgive us. We just hope time will help heal. And that's it. We keep re-entering the same hurt. We almost keep wanting to inflict on ourselves the same hurt by re-entering it. I kept re-entering that mugging in Costa Rica just in my mind's eye and I could do the most amazing kung fu punches and flips and I'd throw those guys off the bridges and, and there was an aggression in me towards them. And I think most of us struggle with that. We struggle to forgive. We struggle to identify the beauty in the other person. We just want to see them suffer in the same way that we suffered. There was a place I stayed in in Panama. I stayed a bloke called Adolfo. He was 24 years old, married, little girl, unemployed, living in a tin shed. He let me stay the night. They didn't have any food, but they managed to, oh, they got me some, a bread roll uh, and some lemongrass tea in the morning that he cut himself. Um, but this bloke was, he was young, he was depressed, and he was having to leave home to go to Panama, 200 kilometers away, in order to get some work, to get some money for his family. <laughs> so it was a really sad, uh, got a few waves here, really sad uh, case with Adolfo, a lovely bloke. We're actually carrying a little, toy on my backpack. I don't know if I can get my arm down quite enough. A little toy there that he gave me. Uh, it's his daughter's little doll. So that's my mascot now. Uh, the other thing that happened when I was coming across into San Jose and here in Costa Rica, I actually got bitten by a scorpion, which I didn't get the scorpion on tape, but <laughs> I had my reaction on tape and watching my body swell up. That was a pretty dangerous day. Um, so we've missed that though, you just have to take my word for it that I got stung and that my body swelled up like a balloon. 
But for now, it's Costa Rica. And this is actually the best representation I can give to you of what it was like coming home to Australia with post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, there were elements of post-traumatic stress disorder that were nothing to do with forgiving others. And even coming back to Australia, people would crack jokes anytime I asked the question, oh, can I get a lift with you? People would laugh and say, oh, you can just walk. Now, what they meant, or what they were thinking at least, was, well, you know, he's a guy walking, he likes walking. But when they said he can just walk, all I thought of were the guns, the knives, people chasing me out of villages, refusing accommodation because of racial tensions. I was the wrong skin colour. People trying to stone me to death. All of the bad stuff. I needed to forgive. I needed to take that time to claim what Jesus has won for us. Jesus has set us free. He's broken the chains. We are no longer slaves to unforgiveness, to sin. We aren't bound to it. We are set free in love. There's something about walking in big heavy rain that makes you just want to move to Western Australia. So while it's raining, I might take this opportunity just to touch on something that I realised the other day. A few people had said to me when I was talking about unity that they were really happy to be praying for unity. And their closing remark was along the lines of, yes, well, in the end, we're just brothers and sisters in the Lord, and that's all that matters. We should get along. It didn't really sit well with me. I wasn't sure why. But what I've realised lately is that it's bordering on tolerance rather than on being united, as in, you can do what you want to do and I'll do what I want to do. And in the end, we're just brothers and sisters in the Lord. So therefore we should get along. So it's very important, I realize that if we don't let unity just sit at tolerance, but we go beyond tolerance to actually physically be united. That's all, food for thought. Still raining. So many bad things had happened on the journey. I'd nearly lost my life so many times. There are 11 occasions where I thought I was about to die. How do I forgive people? How do I continue to extend that invitation of love, of mercy to those around me? That is a continual journey. There were, in the end, three things that helped me once I made it back to Australia. Now, the first one is that my oldest sister, Sophie, is a doctor of psychology and she specialises in post-traumatic stress disorder. But Sophie gave me some really nice tools to help me in certain moments. I think the nicest moment, though, in my discussions with her was actually her saying to me, Sam, you have to understand that what you're going through now is normal. You are this way because this is what you had to do to survive. The problem now is you're back in Australia and you get into situations where in the past it meant danger and now it doesn't. You just have to learn to be like everyone else again. It's just going to take time, but know that you are this way because, what you, because of what you went through. That's normal. Now, the second thing that helped me was that Garrett Publishing, a publishing firm in Australia, asked me to write the book of the walk around the world. I didn't want to touch it, but I responded to them by saying, thanks, but no thanks. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to re-enter that. I gave them permission to. I said, you're welcome to if you want to. I'll give you my notes and you've got newspaper clippings and everything else. And they said, no, 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 no. We want you to write it. We want your perspective on it. They persisted gently. 
over many months. And eventually I started writing, uh, then I stopped, then started writing again. But then an amazing thing happened because the more I wrote, the more I realized how much I'd forgotten. And what I had forgotten were the amazing moments of the journey, the spectacular moments, the beautiful moments. I'd forgotten the hilarious moments. And by the time I finished writing that book, I actually finished grateful for the journey. Instead of just not wanting to talk about it, instead of feeling like that was the worst 19 months of my life. I now look back on it with nothing more than gratefulness. The third thing that helped me through the journey was prayer. I didn't like people. I was scared of people. People were the greatest danger to me over the course of the journey. But I happened to get a job with Youth Mission Team Australia over in Perth in Western Australia. And the beautiful thing was our office had a chapel right next door, an adoration chapel. I'd go and spend time in silent prayer, in adoration. And through that, I began to learn to love again. Ultimately, because through that, I began to recognise the dignity, the integrity of everyone else around me. Even those who had caused pain throughout the journey, they themselves had a dignity, had a worth that wasn't able to be touched. They were incredible people. They just made bad choices. In the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter six, Jesus says, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I don't know if you've ever thought about it in these terms, but forgiveness, is part of why we're here. We're here to learn how to forgive. In fact, every moment when someone does something that hurts us is actually an amazing blessing because within that, we're now given an opportunity to learn to be like God. And then later on in Matthew's gospel, in chapter 18, it says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. So I said at the start of this episode, sometimes that 77 times, Sure, it might be for 77 different times that that person has sinned against us. It could very well be, as it was for me, forgiving the same person 77 times for the exact same incident because I refused to let go. Forgiveness is an amazing journey. It's a journey filled with hope. Holy Father, we thank you for the gift of every person we've ever met. We pray, Lord God, that you would bless us with love, with hearts that burn for one another, that burn for unity and truth and in love with each person around us. Please bless us with the grace to humbly repent and to humbly ask for forgiveness from those around us and to humbly forgive those who have trespassed against us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
quite exciting to go down in there. A lot of people have been saying that it really is the place to spot wildlife, so I'll keep the camera handy and see what we can find today. Now, heading into the town of Thermopolis. It's the world's largest hot springs. But I unfortunately won't have time to do that. I've got to organise my Russian visa to organise my income tax for Australia. My life is a miracle. Every child has a story of, of God's love to share. Shalom world, tune into God's love story.